And I definitely think there's an internalized inferiority complex that is at play. Because when you have bad service or a bad experience with somebody of another race, if you have a bad accountant who's a white man, you're never like, see, that's why I don't do business with white men. But if you have an accountant that's black and you feel like they took three extra days to get your tax return done, that's why I don't do We have to challenge ourselves. Why, when we critique each other, do we critique based upon race? And when, if and when we have a problem with someone else, we don't attribute it to their race. Welcome back to Impostrix Podcast. My name is Whitney Knox Lee, and I'm your host. This is season three of Impostrix Podcast, where we are focusing on validating small business owners of color, entrepreneurs, and folks who unfortunately are navigating employment discrimination in their workplace. Impostrix Podcast always puts folks of color first. So all of our guests are people of color who are sharing about their personal experience or their learned experience. So buckle up, let's go. Welcome back to Impostrix Podcast. My name is Whitney Knox Lee and I'm your host. I am joined today by Roxanne Smithers, who's the founder and managing member of the Smithers Law Group. I'm really excited for this conversation because um, Roxanne has a wealth of information as we are talking about Black businesses and entrepreneurship, and I'm really looking forward to picking her brain on some of the big questions that I have, and I'm sure many listeners who are thinking about um, opening their own businesses or hanging their own shingles may have. Um, So Roxanne has a passion for working with entrepreneurs and small business owners, and she practices, so she's an attorney. And she practices in commercial litigation, corporate law, construction, contract review and negotiation, and provides general counsel services. Um, And she is here in Atlanta with me and very well known in our community. So I'm really, really glad to have you on, Roxanne. Thanks for joining us. Thanks, Whitney. I'm really excited to be here and to chat, obviously, about something that I am passionate about, which is business, small business, medium-sized business, and particularly Black-owned businesses. Excellent. And she's wearing this amazing shirt that says, Minding My Black-Owned Business. (laughs) Yes, I love it. A friend of mine gifted it to me as sort of a, she puts together these uh, uh, Easter baskets for her friends. And uh, this was in my Easter basket one year. So I have been repping it since then. And I get a lot of comments on it whenever I wear it. Nice. So Roxanne, one thing that I did not mention was your podcast, your show. So I would love for you to introduce yourself in your own words. Um, what identities do you bring to this conversation? Um, and tell us about your show. Sure. So um, I'm a black woman, unapologetically so. And uh, so that that's the first thing that's kind of coming into the room. Um, I'm an attorney, a speaker, a teacher. Um, I'm a Christian, so that perspective always comes into my what I'm bringing to the table. Entrepreneur, <laughs> I'm a burgeoning, I guess, sort of a podcast or talk show host um, with our show, The Ladies Room, that we've uh, that I've been working on with HFN Streaming, and I'm also sort of taking on and embracing a other identity and and working to to just take ownership of the term spinster. So I'm working on a project about reclaiming the term spinster and challenging sort of the negative connotations of that. So we can talk about that too. So I'm I'm, I'm, I'm all over the place. So ultimately I'm just Roxanne. (laughs) Ooh, I love that. Um, Okay. I'm going to resist the urge to ask (laughs) about that more um, because I want to stay on topic and that is not. mm -mm. So let me (laughs) ask you though. A little bit. Okay, then tell us what what's happening. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm. A, this is sort of my personal passion project, aside from my business things that mm-hmm. I'm working on. Um, I'm I'm at this stage where I've really just embraced that, and I've been um, working over the last couple of years to really find a balance in being single, never married, no kids, the stereotypical spinster, Mm -hmm. and um, enjoying that and not thinking about it as a problem that needs to be fixed or to be solved. 
And as I would have these conversations with people where I would jokingly be like, oh, this is my spinster Friday when I swim and I sit in the steam room and do all these things, I get this visceral reaction. People, don't use that word. Don't say that. You're great. You're, you're this, you're that. And it really made me to think about, well, why do people have such a visceral reaction to that word and to that concept and to the idea that you will be comfortable in that state and not sort of breathlessly trying to pursue a, you know a relationship or open to what happens or not or doesn't happen and so i feel like it was kind of put on me to work on that so i'm working on a book working on um building sort of a conversation in a community around claiming that term claiming the concept and enjoying that um that life a good contract is worth its weight in gold are you a creative entrepreneur who contracts your services to others? Well, listen up, because this is for you. The Smithers Law Group has created 14 master contracts specifically for creative entrepreneurs. These contracts are industry-specific, they're fully customizable, and you only pay a one-time fee. This is so much better and more affordable than speaking with a attorney who is going to charge you an hourly consultation fee. And it's so much more secure than just Googling up your contract and hoping for the best. Find your fully customizable and industry specific contract at stulawgroup.com. Search for the contract link. And don't forget to tell them that I sent you. And so it's very interesting. And I think also I wonder how our identities and perspectives um, as women of color, as black women come into this mix. Um, and I think maybe this is our segue into entrepreneurship because for me, um, I know, so we have the American dream that we grew up with here, where of course the goal for all of us, no matter our race, um, is to get married, have the kids, have the house, have the dog, have the friends. Right. And um, if we don't do that, we are not successful. Mm -hmm. So I think that's pretty standard, um, regardless of maybe the community that you were, were born into. But what I'm also seeing is that Anything, I'm seeing how anything outside of that causes so much anxiety and causes so much fear and does come with this, we want to whisper about it or we don't want to say it out loud um, until we're actually okay as if we're not going to be okay. And so, you know, I think an example is this Spencer identity of not having the, the family and all the things and it's like you needing to reassure people that like, no, I'm happy, actually. Like, right, right. It's or just this idea that, you know, the way I talk about it, it's something that can happen by circumstance or by choice or, or mm -hmm. a combination. You know, there were phases of life that I was in where these were things I most certainly wanted and pursued. But I reached a point where I had to ask myself, okay, what if those things don't happen? What does that mean? What does my life look like? How do I feel about it? And am I going to stay in a state of not enjoying what I have because I'm so focused on what I don't have? Yeah. And so that's the perspective that I'm coming from. I think that I call it the like spinster industrial complex where there's so much media and people making so much sort of money and noise and attention around telling you that there's something wrong with you and how you need to, how you can fix your, your life or your circumstance, mm -hmm. that it's a problem mm -hmm. to be solved. And if you do this different, smile more, don't smile, be more aggressive, don't be aggressive, be a lady, be a this, act like a wife, don't act like a wife, wear lipstick to the, you know, you get, you get tied up into something's wrong with you. And so the question is, well, what are the positives? What are the things about my life that I'm enjoying and appreciating? And if it happens and being honest and being able to say, yeah, companionship, these may be things that you want. What happens if they don't come in the picture that you envision? 
And is that picture something you truly wanted or were you conditioned to want it? Same thing with, you know, with, with children. Is it just, we're sort of brought up to have that as the expectation. And when you step back, is it really the thing that you personally want? Because if it is, Mm -hmm. and you haven't made it happen, does that mean you didn't really want it? So working on Mm -hmm. that and, 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 and bringing that to the table, and hopefully there will obviously be, there's an entrepreneurial component to that, but that's one of the many projects or hats that I have. Yeah. Well, and so (laughs) thinking about just the role that career plays in this narrative of what our lives as women, as Black women is supposed to look like, I, my parents and most people around me, uh, particularly people of color, worked for somebody. And the thought of being an entrepreneur, of starting my own business gave me so much anxiety around the instability that Mm -hmm. I internalized as needing to have and that I internalized as something that would be indicative of my worth. And starting to think about not working for someone, not having this W-2 job um, and doing my own thing was really an identity. I don't want to call it a crisis, but maybe an expansion of my identity um, that I had never before considered happening, not because I don't have my own ideas about what I want to do, but because as a woman, as a mother, I felt I needed that financial stability. Um, and so I'm really interested. Well, and let me also share my husband told me shortly before I wound up leaving my last job that I'm not a good employee. And (laughs) I remember being (laughs) that, I mean, that could be an insult or a compliment. It depends. Look, I was offended. I, because (laughs) in my, from my perspective and as far as my values for employment and work were concerned, what was important was to be a good employee because if I wasn't a good employee, then I wasn't gonna be employed. So (laughs) I need to be a good employee to be able to get that stability. And when I started to release the idea of financial stability through a job and started to be more expansive in my thinking about how to bring in an income, how much income I need, um, and w- what is, what's the impact that I want to have around me? How do I want to live my life? Where is joy in all of this? Um, the more that I started to receive that sentiment as a compliment of like, no, I'm, I'm bigger. Right. I'm bigger than, you know, this situation right this second and it doesn't mean forever and it doesn't mean I won't work for anybody ever again but it means that right now I do I do need to expand and have that faith that we will be okay and so I wonder one of the things that I've been uh thinking about for this conversation is discussion about what some of the challenges are as we move from a being somebody's employee to entrepreneurship. Um, what are the challenges that people can foresee potentially having and how do we navigate that? Yeah. Well, you know, first thing I, I would say, kind of on the big picture in terms of the conversation of an employee versus an entrepreneur, I think the first thing is we also have to be very clear that one is not better than the other. There's not a value judgment on on you one way or the other if you work for somebody else or you work for yourself because here's the reality at the end of the day even if you decide to work for yourself in order for your business to grow at some point you're going to need someone to work for you right so you know employees are necessary and and it's just as important and it's just a matter of to some people you know temperament, preference, risk toleration, it's not necessarily for everyone. Just like it's it's not 
necessarily for everyone's personality to work for someone else. It's not necessarily in everyone else's personality or wheelhouse or passion to work for themselves. And so there's no kind of judgment in either direction. And you can go through phases where you are one or the other or both at any point in in, in life. And the skills that you get in either arena will apply in, you know, in the other direction, right? So there are ways to be entrepreneurial while being an employee. I think that's important. I also think as our economy changes, that the notion of of stability in the same sense that we used to have in prior generations in terms of working for someone, that is a becoming a bit of a myth, right? Because as we see with changes in companies, outsourcing, changes in technology, um, the economy up and down, we don't have that same sort of tradition of you work for a company, if you're loyal to them, You'll work there for 20, 30 years, put your family through school or what have you, and you'll retire with your golden, you know, your gold watch, and you'll have a pension or a retirement plan and you'll move on. So the there's a myth of stability in in W-2 employment that's not necessarily there. Because your job is dependent on the whims of the manager that you work for, the division, all these things that are outside of your control that are impacting whether or not you have a job today or you have a job tomorrow. So I think one, reframing how we think about what it means to be an employee can help people get over the hurdle of that fear of um, that they're giving up stability. Cause it's a bit of an illusion, quite honestly, um, you know, to a certain extent. And then the flip side of that is what you can often gain when you work for yourself is control in a different sense, that you are not at the whims necessarily of, does my manager like me? Does the person that I've spent my time building a great rapport with get a promotion and they move to a different department and now everything has changed or my company gets bought by another company and everything that I've known about how I've worked it's totally different now because we were absorbed by somebody else. And now I I have a whole different life structure. So there's a little bit, you know, you can trade some of that illusion of stability for more control in what happens to your career in the ceiling in terms of what you can make and possibly in the way that you do it. Um, So that can be, you know, one of the trade-offs between being an employee and being an entrepreneur, an entrepreneur. And there's some gray area in between. But besides that, I think that some of the important things that you have to think about, one, those mindsets, sort of understanding that that stability is a myth to a certain extent. And then what you're gaining oftentimes is more control over your career, how much you can make, how you want to work, how you want to order your life, depending on the type of entrepreneurship or industry that you go into. So that mindset shift. I think it's also important for people to understand the shift in terms of responsibility and the way you have to think about things and see the world between being an employee and being a um, an entrepreneur or, or a business owner. Um, I, I use this analogy oftentimes, and I say it's sort of the difference of when you were a teenager And you're like, I can't wait till I'm grown so I can do whatever I want. And no one tells me what to do. And then you become an adult and you realize everybody tells you what to do. And you're responsible for everything. Whereas as a kid, it was, you know, go to school, keep my room clean, generally follow the rules that someone else has laid out. But I don't have to think about how we got here. Well, it's the same way with being an employee versus an entrepreneur. Employee, generally speaking, you're going to come in, clock in, and whatever are the tasks that are around your job, that's all you have to think about. You don't have to think about whether the you know the rent was paid at the business. You don't have to think about where the business is coming from, have the supplies come in, You know what's the vision, what's the structure. You just have to make your widgets or whatever your job is. Well, as an adult, you've got to think about those bigger pictures that your teenage self 
didn't have to think about. You're thinking about the lights, the mortgage, the property tax. Did I do my homestead exemption? Um, what's that noise? You know, did I make sure that the faucet is 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 dripping when the temperature drops? You got to think about all those things on top of whatever the thing is that is the business and the passion that you want to have. And I often businesses or entrepreneurs that I find that struggle get behind the eight ball is they're very gung-ho about the passion, the thing that they want to do, or they're very gung-ho about not reporting to anyone, anyone, not having a boss. And they miss that now you are responsible for all the mechanisms that will allow you to partake in your passion. And the business side will often take far more of your time than the passion, particularly if you want it to actually pay your bills. Now, if you just want passion, then I say just get a hobby and keep it moving. But if you want your talent or skills to actually pay for the life that you want to live, then you got to do the business side. You got to do the grown up side. And that means you actually have a lot of bosses. <laughs> the licensing people, your customers, your clients, if you have a physical space, the landlord, the permitting office, the health department, you you got a lot of bosses <laughs> versus one boss when you're an employee. But you've got control and you have the say. So you're trading off those things. Uh, so those, those are some of the big Look. mental hurdles that I, I often see that people have to get over. And then on the practical side, Moolah, money, um, hurdles from both a funding side. You know, we don't, I don't have to repeat the statistics in terms of the funding disparities for um, Black businesses, for Black women owned businesses, how, you know, little we get in terms of venture capital when you're on that, that huge scale, you know, despite all the efforts to knock down certain funds that are trying to support us that are maybe 1% of the venture capital money that's out there. Um, but that's another hurdle, having the funding to lay a solid foundation and also having and identifying the resources that you need. So the experts and the professional services that you need to really um, start a business in a strong way that it will really kind of stand the test of time and provide the life that you want to live. Mm. So I'm over here, like my head is about to fall off because I'm in this process, right? I'm in this process of mm -hmm. business formation um, with my consulting business. And we may have another business opening up here in my family soon. And when I tell you I had no idea about the administrative component of owning a business and that what you said about more of your time being spent on all that other stuff than on the passion that is yes. exactly my yeah. experience um more recently and i was shocked like i it because it's also it's a trip to your loved one comes home and you want to have something to show for your day but all you have to show is <laughs> that you filed some stuff you know, or that you read right. through the regulations and now you have a better understanding of what it is mm -hmm. you're supposed to be doing. So now anytime my husband comes home and I've made money that day, I'm always like, I made money today. Oh, and it doesn't happen every day. You and know? the expenses, <laughs> we want to understand, the expenses come before the revenue and revenue does not equal profit. Okay. <laughs> so these are my lessons as a liberal arts major who has now had to get comfortable with math, money, and I'm not even totally there. And so that's the other thing. I, I always tell folks when they're looking to start a business, first things you need to do is you need to sit down. One of the first things you need, there are many things, a budget. And I think you should have two types of budgets. You need your startup budget. So you need to count the cost of all the things you're going to have to do to start up this business, whether it's a service business and so it's basically just, you know, shuffle and paper or electronics, or if it's a goods, um, some sort of business where you're actually making a product. Either way, you're going to have a certain amount of startup costs. 
Now you can back into that by, you know, going through the list and there are great resources online to help you figure out some of the line items that you need to have for your startup budget. Then you also need to have an operating budget. So once you kind of get things going, so that's your takeoff, that's your startup budget, think of it as an airplane. Then you need to have your operating budget. That's your cruising sort of altitude. And that are that's going to be the monthly sort of ex, reoccurring expenses to run that business. Some are going to stay constant. There are minimum things you're going to be paying every month. And then there are things that may fluctuate. But you need to at least have an idea of what those things are going to be. And then when you're starting, that's where you then find out how much is it going to take for me to actually start this business. Best case scenario is that you then have the money or the funding that's going to match these two budgets. If it doesn't, then you need to raise more money or you have to look at that budget and see what realistic things can I wait on? What things can I not wait on? Because you have to understand that those expenses are going to come before any revenue is generated. And revenue is not the same as profit. So even once your business starts people start paying you for things that does not translate to profit. Um, so it's very important and people want to avoid that. They're afraid of numbers. I get it. The numbers don't go away just because you ignore them. Um, and then it, it's a bit of a snowball because if you don't do those things, then it leaves you in a position where you're not able to, you know, get additional funding or get financial support when you need it or, understand what it's really going to take to price properly your goods or price your services properly so that at some point those revenues actually turn into profit that's a those are great points i appreciate you saying that because it's been interesting um (laughs) to say the least just trying to figure out um some of these things and the the money is you know, I, you were talking about being a business owner is similar to growing up as an adult um, and that, you know, the employee is similar to being a teenager. And as a teenager, I remember always telling my mom, I couldn't wait to be an adult mm-hmm. because I was going to buy as many $1 Slurpees from 7-Eleven <laughs> as I wanted to and hot Cheetos. And she would just say, okay, well, good for you. <laughs> but then two things happened when I became an adult. I started gaining weight is one. Mm-hmm. And two, like $2 a day adds up. Right. <laughs> and and so now I'm learning about how the money works together, right. like how the budget right. works together and, and the revenue and is there a profit and the taxes that Mm -hmm. I need to be taking out before I do absolutely anything. And then, okay, now I don't have a 401k account with my employer. So where, you know, where is savings going and, you know, all of these things. And, um, it, it is something that I certainly was not anticipating as a entrepreneur. Um, And I think, you know, for me, I started out having a side hustle first and the side hustle could be less formal um, in terms of not needing to set up a whole bunch of stuff, um, not needing necessarily to worry about taxes because I was paying over taxes Mm -hmm. in my full time job. Yeah. Um, But now I got to do all that. Exactly. Yeah. 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 So let me ask you, because we've talked about some of the things that we that we need to do and some of the hurdles to, to get over, who would you suggest having on your like startup team, if you will, um, if you're somebody that can afford the services, um, where would you prioritize spending your resources or your time in terms of receiving a service from, you know, the, the various professionals that help you start a business. Right. I mean, so, you know, the two key professionals that you're going to want to have some level of a relationship with and some level of information and resources from, and you can get them at different, you know, different price points, depending on how much you're willing to DIY 
in an informed manner, how much time you're willing to actually sit down and, and learn and understand it and use the resources that are out there to educate you. So the two professions, not because I'm biased, but I, I fix the problems when they don't come out right. You've got to have some level of legal support um, to help explain the various loops and hoops that you have to jump through in terms of forming a business. Fortunately, a lot of people think, well, I've come up with a name or I, I printed business cards. I'm ready to roll. Mm -hmm. Some I, I've registered with the secretary of state. I'm good. There's more to it than just that. So having some level of legal support and information is critical. You want to stay on the law's good side, and then you want to stay on Uncle Sam's good side and his 50 little cousins, which is the state <laughs> version of Uncle Sam. So in that case, you want to have a, a, a CPA. Mm. And at some point, you're going to have to graduate from, you know, what people often have is just a person who prepares their taxes. Mm -hmm. I, I had a cousin, T2, who did taxes on the side. And for many years, cousin T2 did the taxes. Once you're setting up your business and you truly want it to be a business, you're going to have to graduate to a, a more advanced level of tax support. And that's a CPA who is familiar with working with business owners and working with entrepreneurs um, because there are different responsibilities and obligations and options that you're going to have in terms of how you navigate the, you know, your personal taxes, your business taxes, how they sometimes overlap, how they don't overlap, depending on the structure that you set up for your business and depending on how you fund your business and whether you're taking a salary and all these, all these different things. Mm -hmm. So having those two knowledgeable professionals um, as a resource, to some extent, you want to have that and, and budget for some level of a relationship with a CPA and a business attorney. Okay. And you mentioned your cousin, and I want to go right into the question that you actually <laughs> suggested we talk about, which is this kind of fear that we sometimes have, we as people of color, and specifically me as a Black woman, have with working either like contracting or subcontracting with other people of color um, or patronizing their businesses because of maybe difficult um, relationships that we've had with those people in the past, um, maybe because of an internalized inferiority complex. Um, and, you know, and for myself, it's finding that I'm much harder mm -hmm. on black businesses yeah. in terms of my expectations um yeah. and being so critical the moment there's an issue <laughs> and then going and saying see that's why we can't mm -hmm. nobody wants to buy from black businesses because they didn't deliver to me my french fries when i ordered french fries or you know like right. and so yeah. i love um to talk a little bit about navigating um just doing business with friends and family and patronizing black businesses because we know i had an episode during season one um where a cpa came on and talked about how little the dollar bounces around in black communities yes and i want to be someone personally who is investing in the black community and in my community because i live in the black part of town um but also find it difficult to do that. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, I think there are two things you mentioned there, you know, two sides to it. There's doing business with family and friends, which we are often hesitant to do. And that can also play into um, patronizing our own business owners um, and, and really understanding that. And I am, definitely pro doing business with family and friends as long as you understand 
that it's business and that you have a clear delineation between the business relationship and the friend relationship. Um, and so one of the things that we also do is we have a YouTube channel where we'll put up videos. And so I definitely, I have a video up about kind of the pro, not the pros and cons, but advice about how to do business with family and friends. And the first thing in all these situations is, you know, it is perfectly fine to have the expectations that you're handling things in a business manner. And that goes in both directions because we will sometimes, um, with that internalized inferiority complex, and I definitely think there's an internalized inferiority complex that is at play. Because when you have bad service or a bad experience with somebody of another race, if you have a bad accountant who's a white man, you're never like, see, that's why I don't do business with white men. But if you have an accountant that's black and you feel like they took three extra days to get your tax return done, that's what I'm doing. We have to challenge ourselves. Why, when we critique each other, do we critique based upon race? And when, if and when we have a problem with someone else, we don't attribute it to their race. We don't do that. And I, I have clients that hit all spectrums, all economic levels, all races, all genders. And I have seen people doing stuff raggedy in all directions. And the stereotypical, I like on our show, the um, ladies room, we call them Beauregard. I've had clients with Beauregard coming in their suit and they're a mess. Their stuff's not where they don't know what they're talking about. But we give them this this benefit of the doubt that they know what they're doing they know what they're talking about and if they mess up we don't make it a condemnation of them as a whole and their group as a whole but on the flip side we automatically make it a condemnation of you know our whole race if we have a bad experience with something you're going to have bad business people in in any direction uh, so we really have to be conscious of that. We have to challenge ourselves on that. And also, we can sometimes be hypocritical where we will expect them to give us a break in terms of, you know, do we have all our stuff in on time? What kind of pricing are we getting from them? So we expect the kin folk and skin folk break, but then we want to hold them to a perfect um standard of performance so that's the flip side of it as well so don't come for the sister girl discount and then have an issue if i then relate to you sister girl when i'm providing the services so my my recommendation for all of that whether it's you know supporting a business or it is doing business with family and friends is that you maintain the corporate structure and the business relationship. I'm always going to shout from the mountaintop, have a contract with everybody. Make sure that contract is signed and that everybody follows the contract. And so that you can carefully and clearly delineate when we're chit-chatting and doing stuff as friends and when we are working on something as business partners. And so I have a good or bad habit of my clients become friends my friends become clients. And so it's important for me to make sure I'm clear on, on, on what those relationships are. So, you know, you call me on a Saturday night on my cell phone, you're calling me as a friend. You want to kiki about Bravo, that's fine. But if you want to talk to me about work, then I'm like Big Red from um, the Five Heartbeats. My office hours are Monday through Friday, <laughs> nine to five. Here's my work email and here's my work phone number. And we're going, and you're going to be billed for that. I talk about Bravo all day for free. But if you want to ask me about something that has to do with my law degree that I'm still paying for, then I'm going to need my retainer in place. I'm going to need a signed engagement agreement. We're going to open the matter. And we're going to schedule those conversations. And we're going to have a scope of work. And we're going to work through it so that it's very clear what is the business relationship and what's the friendship relationship? And some people will bristle at that, but I feel like if I treat everyone the same in that way, then if you bristle, that's on you because I'm treating everyone the same. Um, I can count on a couple fingers, the people who will get the discount from me. Everybody else, you got to sign up and you got to pay. 
chit chat, no and chit chat, and I'll take you and treat you to dinner on the money you done paid me for my legal services, and we can kiki. But work is work, so I think that there's that. So it has to go in both directions. Where you're not expecting more for them, or if you are expecting a sort of kinfolk discount, then you need to give a kinfolk grace, but can't go in the other direction. Um, and then questioning that inferiority complex that we can bring to the table. Uh, because think about it, no one's perfect. So if I mess up on something, I don't want you to be like, well, that's why I don't work with black people. Right? No, it's Roxanne mm-hmm. missed, missed something or Roxanne forgot to do whatever. Happens very rarely, but it does. But don't charge it to, <laughs> we shouldn't yeah. charge it to each other because we know that we're all individuals. And so we shouldn't do that to someone else. So, so I'm very big on that. I think it is so important that we are making an effort to um, circulate our dollars internally, particularly if we're going to talk to other people and we're going to go out into the world and be like, buy black, support black businesses, support black women, support this. Then I'm going to look at, okay, what's your roster? of who are you using? Are you making a conscious effort mm-hmm. to make sure that you're spending your dollars with um, within our community? Are you making a conscious effort to support their efforts? Are you making a conscious effort to pay their rate, pay for their products? Because we also know, we know the funding challenges, we know what's out there. So if they're pricing higher, they're, they may be pricing for true quality and you know they're not buying in bulk and able to give a lower rate. If we truly want ourselves to progress and want our businesses to progress and want to shrink that, that wealth gap, we gotta put our dollars to work too. And maybe sometimes that means spending more if it's a business that's doing a quality job and they are circulating funds within the, in the community. They're paying a good rate to their employees then we've got to put our dollars to it as well versus spending exorbitant amounts with other companies and other, you know, other business. I am in a hundred percent agreement agreement and listening to you talk, I'm like, dang, I need to go open that bank account, that black bank. <laughs> you too. <laughs> Just on principle. <laughs> um but all right, thank you so much for for joining us. I do want to ask you um, maybe just one more question, and that is around building up a network of support around you as a black entrepreneur, a black business owner. Um, I some of the advice that I've gotten is to have other friends who are entrepreneurs because. Initially, this is what I'm told. I'm going to go to my friends and I'm going to talk about these issues and they're going to be interested and excited and, you know, whatever. But then like later, they're going to be tired of listening to me. They're not going to know what I'm talking about because they don't have to deal with it. And, you know, they're not really going to know how to relate. And so it can be really valuable, I'm told, to have uh, some folks in your life who you all can bounce ideas off of around the business ownership. And I wonder what your thoughts are around building that network and finding mentors within, um, you know, whatever the community of people is who, who are business owners. Yeah. Um, I, and that's great advice. And and I'll get into a pros and cons or why not necessarily pros. There are no cons to it really. I think that there are essentially four, sort of types of relationships you need to have as a business owner. So you need both mentors and colleagues that are within your industry, because it's good to have people who are facing the kind of the exact same challenges that you are in terms of growing or developing your business. And it's it's always good to learn from them how they're approaching things, you want a comparative in terms of pricing, particularly when you're in a service industry. It can be hard to figure out, okay, what's the market? Where should I be pricing? What are what are the things that the market will bear that I didn't think the market would bear in terms of how I'm setting things up or potential offerings, resources that I could use, you know, apps, programs, services, all of those things. 
And so you want somebody who's a mentor, who's been doing it, that you can look up to and you can learn from them. But then it's also good to have people that are kind of at your same stage or close to your stage so that you guys can kind of go through it together and find resources and be a support for each other in that way. Right. So that's within your industry. Then I also think it's important to have, again, mentors and colleagues who are um, simply business owners and who are not in your industry and are in different who are in different industries and different fields. And for that reason, because they very often may be your customers or your audience and having people outside of your industry gives you a diversity of thought and you may see things and find things from a different group that you can apply to your business. So like one of the groups that I'm in, it there are a lot of coaches, um, life coaches, business coaches in this group. And I was telling you earlier, they're very woo woo. <laughs> and I'm very much first line traditional, but they're rubbing off on me, right? And so being the only lawyer in this group, I'm bringing a little more practicality. I'm like, no, you got to make sure you have a contract. You got to make sure it's signed. You got to make sure you get paid. So I'm kind of toughening them up a bit on that side. And they're softening me up a bit. Where I'm like, I'm going to do a mastermind. I'm good. So I have a legal mastermind that I've put together. And then I have, you know, a, a school that I work with that pays me to do this five week course for business owners. But that's an idea that I got from hanging out with coaches. I wouldn't have got that idea from working with other lawyers where they're just like, get clients and you charge by the hour. I was like, I'm coming up with a checklist and I'm coming up with a mastermind. But that's from working with people who are very different from me, right? So I think it's important to have those sort of quadrants. So have colleagues and mentors that are in your industry and colleagues and mentors that are not in your industry that you can learn from. And there are also resources, there are referrals because you're the lawyer. So they'll send, or you're the, you're the, the consultant, whatever you are, when you're around people who don't do what you do, they will send people to you. And then you also have people to send to them because you don't do what they do. So there's not a competition there as well. So it's good to have them that way. Um, and in any of those groups, it's, it's, a, it's important to have an accountability partner, um, particularly when you are a business owner and you work by yourself, if you're the sole owner of your company. Having another person that you have sort of a regular check-in or interaction with where you can talk about, okay, these are the things that I want to get done by this date, or these are the decisions that I need to make. And you can hold each other accountable and somebody to bounce ideas off of um, that otherwise you miss out on when you don't have business partners. And I have gone from having two business partners to one business partner to being uh, professionally divorced and having no business partners. And there are pros and cons, just like being single and being married. There are pros and cons. And I'm, I'm, I'm enjoying my personal singleness and I'm enjoying my professional singleness. But one of the things I miss is that we have monthly firm meetings and we had an agenda. And if for nothing else, I always knew that I got to report back to my business partner, did I get the things done on the list that I was responsible for? Even if she wasn't necessarily, you know, checking the list or holding me to it, I felt a sense when you have another person. It's just like having a workout buddy. If we both gonna get up at six, hell, all right, let me get up because I don't want this chick waiting for me at the park and I didn't show up. And it gets you up when you don't want to get up. So when you're a solo business partner, having an accountability person. And so I sought out another attorney that I'm friends with. We've done business. We used to work together. We used to be W-2s together. And now we have our own firms. And was like, let's, it took us two months to get it on the calendar because we're so busy. But we finally put a standing Zoom or a standing conference call on the calendar to check in. And it's already helping because just that sense of, ooh, I got to make sure I get this done because I got to tell Cecily whether or not I got this thing done. You know, she's not going to do anything to me, but there, it, it's something psychological. So that um, and then the places you can find these folks, I would say, you know, every locality has local small business groups or business groups like your city, your county. They've all got entrepreneur groups, business groups, your chambers of commerce, whether they're big or small. 
you can get to people who are different from you and find a crew. Um, and then your industry organizations will have different groups and you can be part of formally or you can kind of put together your own kind of crew. Um, I'm also in a secret lady lawyer group. Don't tell anybody. There's about six of us that we started. We just realized it's been 10 years since we've had our little secret lady lawyer group. And you, we just wanted a place where we could come and kind of talk about what's going on in our practice. Um, it's a cone of, of um, confidentiality so that we could be very open about our challenges or what we're doing or be like, do you know this person? Are they shady? You know, we could kind of check people's references. Yeah, that's and so cool. you can't have it where people know who's in the group because then people want to be in the group and you can't have everybody in the group. So it's got to be a small group. So get you a secret group. And that y'all kind of, you know, can support each other. And so I think those are the different ways that you can find people. And then it's important to have people that plug in in different places in your life and in your business. Yeah. Awesome. Wow. Thank you so much. This has been very insightful, a very helpful conversation. Can you share with us where people can find you, how we can access your show, your talk show? Um, but also, of course, how we can get to your services. Yeah, absolutely. So we didn't even get to that. So the ladies room is our, our show that we've been um, developing. We've got our first episodes up on YouTube. And the idea behind that was, you know, women, where do we, you know, we go to the ladies room in groups and pairs to strategize, to support each other. And so I wanted to take that concept to a group of women talking openly and honest business women and executives about their, their experience. And so the concept is the ladies room is also the boardroom. It's wherever we decide to be and, and take control. Uh, and so that is available on YouTube um, at HFN Streaming. Um, but all of my information, you can get to pretty much everything I'm doing from our website, which is stulawgroup.com. Um, you can get us on LinkedIn. You can get us on Facebook. I've got my Instagram, both for the firm as well as Spinster. It's uh, Spinster Roxy. So two R's on Instagram. I'm starting to post my little stuff about that and and get some ideas. Yes. I'm also posting on that on my on my Facebook page as well. So. A lot of hats, but pretty much everything you can get to us from our um, website or just Google me, Roxanne, no E, Smithers. <laughs> Thank you so much. I, I look forward to following the spinster situation um, because I think that's going to be so cool. So thank, thank you, you again. Thanks so much for joining me for this conversation. I hope that you got as much out of it as I did. Feel free to continue the conversation with us over on Facebook at the Impostrix Podcast Validating Space. We welcome all, and it's a space for us to validate each other as we work through work, race, and imposter syndrome. You can find out more about me or about the podcast at www.impostrixpodcast.com. And don't forget to follow me on Instagram at Podcast. Until next time, be validated. <laughs>